dedicated to each and every one of you who appreciate a great glass of wine. You know what I mean? It's Monday. Let's raise a glass to the beginning of another week. It's time to unscrew, uncork, or savor a bottle. And let's begin exploring the wine glass. A couple of years ago, I had the honor of visiting Abruzzo for a press trip. It was an incredible week filled with amazing views and magnificent wine. I learned so much about the region and fell in love with its wines. I linked my article about the trip in the show notes. Today, I am sharing the audio from a Wine Scholar Guild webinar I attended a while back. It was relatively long and took place over two days, so I'm splitting it up into multi-episodes. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. While you're listening, it would be greatly appreciated if you could take one minute to subscribe, rate, and review. It takes only a few seconds of your time, but means so much to the show. The next best way to support Explore the Wine Glass is to tell your friends. If you enjoy the podcast, your wine-loving friends will too. Follow me on all the socials. And finally, don't forget to head over to the website, exploringthewineglass.com, to read the blog and sign up for the newsletter and keep up with all happening. Slancha. Hey everybody, I'm Lori Budd, a UC Davis winemaking program, Spanish wine scholar, Somme Day service, champagne and Cote de Ron specialist, and a WSET level 2 graduate. You can find Exploring the Wine Glass on all the socials, as well as your favorite podcast catchers. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's the perfect time to swipe, subscribe, rate, and review. Stay in the know about all things wine by visiting my website, exploringthewineglass.com. I promise I'll never tell you what to drink, but I'll always share what's in my glass. Very, very special. You are so special. And the styles of wine being produced in this very interesting region. Uh, so Andrea has prepared a presentation for today's webinar, and um, she'll be back then uh, again next week as well for part two. Um, so we hope that you can join us again. Okay, thank you so much, Preston. Sure. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, okay, so the presentation has been prepared by the um, Consorzio for the Wines of Abruzzo. And I've done a little uh, kind of making it my own a little bit. And a little bit uh, before we launch into Abruzzo, why did Abruzzo reach out to us to, to give this presentation? Well, I think that they understand that uh, Italian Wine Scholar Program is definitely um, the industry's most respected certification course on the wines of Italy and uh, look to us to be a leader in educating people about the various regions. So thank you for reaching out to us, Abruzzo. And if you do find yourself really enjoying this kind of in-depth look into the wines of Abruzzo, the territory of Abruzzo, and you want to know more about the wines of all the regions of Italy, then make sure you check out uh, our website. And I would love to see some of you in an upcoming Italian Wine Scholar class. So for today, we're just going to kind of give you a little bit of agenda about what we're going to look at. We're going to take a look at the wine region, uh, the region of Abruzzo in general, and then the, the wine region itself, the wines and um, where those wines are coming from. A little bit of um, discussion about the consortium and what they do. And then looking at production, the various uh, aspects that make the wines what they are. So the soils, the climate, winemaking, and then look at those individual denominations and some of the varieties and the, the vineyards and uh, what makes these wines really special. So here we are. Um, let's take a look at the wine region of Abruzzo. And here we are within the country of Italy, of course. And here's our little arrow pointing us to Abruzzo. And what do we need to know about Abruzzo? Well, we're going to look uh, quite a bit at the topography here, but just kind of for general reference, it's located in the sort of we would consider the east central part of Italy and uh, faces the Adriatic Sea. So what makes Abruzzo so well suited to viticulture? OK, we're going to look at the climatic fa factors that really make Abruzzo special. We're going to look at some of those really um topographical features that make Abruzzo unique. And of course, we're going to look at those indigenous grape varieties that um, 
really make those wines of Abruzzo stand apart from, from other regions. And we're going to talk about this leap forward in terms of the qualitative growth. So uh, a lot of us probably have an idea of Abruzzo in our mind about what the wines are, but I think there has been a big change in the last generation in terms of the focus of the winemaking and the, the quality of the wines that are coming out of Abruzzo. So here we are with a little bit more of a zoomed in look of uh, the region itself. And you'll notice on this little map here that there are a lot of uh, mountain icons and a lot of hill icons. And that is really important. And it is a big factor about what makes Abruzzo so special. So you can essentially divide the topography of Abruzzo into sort of three bands. And if I get my little pointer out here, this sort of uh, strip right in here, okay, um, very narrow kind of coastline that runs about uh, 80 miles, 130 kilometers. Here you have a lot of sandy beaches, especially in this northern half, beautiful beaches up here. Lots of uh, dense Mediterranean scrub down here in the southern half. And then you can see that these, there's uh can't see it on this map. When we get to another map, you'll see that there are some sort of rivers that are running sort of perpendicular here into, into the sea. We're really focused on this middle sort of band in here where we have the strip of gentle hills, um, sort of medium elevation hills, and uh, that kind of beautiful location for, for vineyards. When you get up into here, into this third band, okay, we have these this large mountainous inland area. And in fact, almost two thirds of the territory is covered by mountains. So it is, uh, Abruzzo is the most mountainous region in central and southern Italy. Here we have interspersed sort of within these mountain ranges, these high elevation plateaus, some sort of amphitheater like mountain basins. Um, the mountains themselves are quite steep and they sort of, uh, um, loom sort of abruptly over the landscape and a lot of um, grazing of animals in, in this area as well. You can see Marche to the north there and sort of Lazio to the southwest and then Molise to the south. And there's our Adriatic Sea. Give us an idea of this beautiful landscape of uh, Abruzzo. Clearly that you have this huge diversity within what is relatively small area, right? So you have um, a coastline and beautiful um, seafood and, uh, you know, an industry based around the sea. And then inland, you have these beautiful mountains. And here you can see that they're saying it's situated, the region itself sort of situated between that Adriatic Sea and the Gran Sasso and Meela Massifs. So it has three national parks um, and more than 10 national and regional nature reserves. So it is a land that uh, really is preserving its natural environment. And you feel that when you're in the region, there's a lot of green space and this kind of wild um, sort of uh, un un attached sort of landscape there. If you haven't visited Abruzzo, I really encourage people to, to do that. It is one of these regions that, you know, it's maybe not first on the sort of top five of the tourist places to, to visit in everybody's mind in Italy, but just kind of, you know, going off that sort of beaten track a little bit and uh, you will be amazed at the beauty and the the people, uh, the warmth of the people. And uh, I certainly encourage anybody who's looking for something a little bit different uh, than the big cities and all the sort of, you know, common tourist attractions to, to give Abruzzo a try. So here are some of the things that they really want you to sort of um be kind of front of mind when you think of Abruzzo and the wines and what what gives this place its special character. So as we mentioned, those mountains, um, you have the highest peak in the Apennines there located in Abruzzo, the Gran Sasso. Um, then that nature that I was just speaking about. So more than 30% is protected. Uh, and that's a huge um, something that the uh, Abruzzesi are very proud of. And then, of course, the Adriatic Sea with this coastal area, 
that leads into these hills that are ideally suited to to viticulture. So it's this blend of na of nature and mountains and sea. Beautiful picture of the um, central Apennines there. And of course, you can imagine that that plays significantly into climate. Okay. So a little bit milder on the side of the Apennines that are facing the Adriatic Sea, if that would make sense, right? You're going to have some more of that climatic influence coming in off of the sea. As you move inland, you get more continental influence. It seems to be wherever you are within Abruzzo, you, you will have this large diurnal shift. So remember, diurnal shift is that uh, temperature difference between sort of the, the highs during the day and the lows during night. And um, many people really feel that this is a key factor when it comes to producing high quality wines. And why is that? Well, you want that warm temperature during the day so that the, the vines are functioning well, they are undergoing photosynthesis and they are converting energy, sunlight into sugars. So the, the vines are ripening. And then in the evening and at nighttime, the temperature falls and the vines kind of shut down that process. They rest a little bit, they preserve their acidity and then the process starts again the next day. And that is really thought to lead to complexity in wines and helping to preserve a really good balance of uh, fermentable sugars and acidity. And then of course, good ventilation. And why is good ventilation important? Well, when you have some nice breezes occurring, then you have less issues with fungus and molds and that kind of thing. And so you have um, less need to be sort of spraying in the vineyards and that kind of thing, because you have this good ventilation that is keeping the vines and the grape bunches healthy. Here we have some more pictures that they have supplied. And I think you can really see from this, the kind of diversity of this territory, all the way from those beautiful beaches. Honestly, these beaches are some of the most beautiful in, in Italy, and they tend to be a lot less crowded <laughs> than the, the ones that we are used to seeing on the postcards and uh, on Instagram and that sort of thing. So if you are a lover of the beach, definitely a place to, to check out. And then I think this middle picture just really shows just how wild and untouched a lot of the, the landscape is. And then as I was mentioning before, so here we have uh, the... Trabuki or uh, trabu, uh, Trabuki, which are these, they, the translation is really fishing machine. <laughs> so it is um, this structure that is constructed on these stilts out over the, the sea. And fishermen would actually fish off of there, prepare fish on there. And you can see these dotted along the, the coastline. And some of them have been actually um, kind of converted into restaurants and beautiful place to enjoy absolutely fresh seafood in a stunning uh, setting, sort of milder climate. They tend to have um, sufficient rainfall in most of the area. So that's an important consideration, especially in these days of sort of climate change, where in a lot of Italy, lack of rainfall is really becoming a critical um, point in, in viticulture tend to have a lot of sunlight. Um, it tends to be quite bright there, not a lot of cloud cover, especially in that sort of middle and sort of coastal hill area. And then those diurnal shifts and that ventilation again. So let's look a little bit about the history of uh, this region. Okay. This is a picture of the Valley Palinia. Uh, um, and that comes from the, the Greek, okay, this word paline which means muddy and um muddy slimy i think muddy is a nicer adjective <laughs> but uh in where that name comes from is that in prehistoric times the area was actually occupied by this vast lake um and that happened as a result of earthquakes and floods and it had this rock barrier that was blocking sort of the passage of water to the sea. And so you ended up with this giant inland uh, sort of lake. OK, in there you had this very sort of uh, muddy uh, accumulation uh, of uh, of soils and sediment. And so it is a very sedimentary soil in in most of those sort of coastal hilly areas, okay, so we're of marine origin as well. Um, usually fairly high in clay in some areas, but as you get uh, 
closer to the coast, you have more incidence of sand in there, okay? Uh, that kind of middle band of hills, more marl, sandstone soils with quite significant clay, which again helps in that retention of, uh, of water. And in terms of winemaking, so we can look back here, the first proof of winemaking dating back to these ancient texts, Okay, and then you have the spread of winemaking across the region. And now we're looking at about 35 or 34,000 hectares of vineyards and producing three and a half million hectoliters of wine a year. Okay, and of that, they're very proud to, to say that almost 80% is Montepulciano de Bruzzo. Okay, so of that, 3.5 million, you can see more than a million of those hectoliters are what we would call DOC or DOCG, so um, control designation of de designation of origin wines, and of that, almost 80% are Montepulciano de Bruzzo. So you can see just how important Montepulciano de Bruzzo is to the region. A little bit more about the, the history. Until the Renaissance, you had viticulture really concentrated in the Paligna Valley, okay, in the province of L'Aquila. Uh, After that, we see viticulture kind of um, having this period of rapid transformation during the period of unification, okay? So when Italy became Italy in um, the mid-1800s, then you have this rapid phase of transformation of the, the, the industry. Now you can see in the last sort of 40 to 50 years, we see the winemakers and the viticulturalists sort of abandoning some of the areas that are less suited to vines and really focusing on those uh, hilly coastal um, strips of land. And why is that? Well, during that period of rapid transformation, you see just sort of viticulture spreading and maybe not always in the land that is best suited to producing very high quality wines. Now we see this kind of focus on trying to produce higher quality wines. And so that means looking for those vineyard areas that are best suited to producing high quality wines. So what about the wines themselves? Let's talk a little bit about the consortio. So what is the consortio? So we're talking about a nonprofit association. So their aim is not to raise money for any um, business or that sort of thing. What they're doing is any of the fees that the producers pay into the organization are then used to help protect the wines from that area, to promote them in um, events such as this, and to administer the Appalachian's interests, okay? So uh, when we think of the consortio, really they're very concerned with those protected designations, okay? And they want to make sure that people aren't using the name Abruzzo inappropriately on wines, aren't promoting wines as wines that come from Abruzzo, that don't, uh, that the wines that are uh, made within the region, within those appellations, are following all the rules and regulations that have been set forth in the various disciplinare that um, each region or appellation is, is governed by. You can see that part of their role is ensuring compliance, Okay, so making sure that producers are, are following along with those rules that I mentioned. Um, and then the also the protection of fraud, right, against fraud, and then to promote. So to promote the region itself, to promote the wines, and to try and grow the reach of uh, Abruzzo wines in the export market particularly. As I mentioned before, one of the key points is these. Um, national parks um, and regional parks that really protect a lot of the, the territory, so 30% plus, want to point out that that is one of the reasons that they chose the symbol of the eagle, because they really feel that it is an animal that gives this um, kind of strong protective um, instinct and tenacious like the people of Abruzzo. And while this national, um, these national parks and these nature reserves, yes, they're beautiful. 
but how does it impact winemaking, right? How does it impact the wines that you see in your glass? I think more and more we're realizing that um, some of the healthiest vineyards are the ones that have more of that sort of polyculture to them that are not completely um, devoid of other types of vegetation, that are not devoid of other organisms. And so when you think about healthy wine regions, often it is the ones that have that more diversity to them. And Abruzzo definitely has that. They have tons of natural uh, diversity, and it is something that producers are embracing and learning to promote. And now, a word from our sponsor. Josina Wines loves to give back. There are so many fur babies that deserve to find their forever home. We would love to be able to help as many as possible. If you are part of a nonprofit organization or know of a nonprofit organization that would like to hold a fundraiser, please contact us at contact at dracinawines.com or visit our website, dracinawines.com, to fill out the form. How does the fundraiser work? It is super simple and costs your group absolutely nothing. Together, we will choose a month that your group will be sponsored. During the month, you promote the fundraiser just like any other event you'd hold. At the end of the month, we will donate 20% of the sales to your organization. The donations will be made in the name of each individual who purchased the wine so that you know exactly who helped the animals. Our goal is to raise as much funds as we possibly can and to help as many animals as possible. So please help us help as many fur babies as we possibly can. So in terms of winemaking, how much wine are we making here in Abruzzo? We are talking about uh, a significant uh, amount of land covered by the the vineyards, about 250 wineries, and making about 140 million bottles of Abruzzo wine and contributing about 300 million euros to the, the economy. The yields there are 1.4 tons per hectare or 0.57 tons per hectare. Now, what does that really mean, right? Because it's really hard to to know, okay, what, how does that relate to sort of averages? I guess you could say sort of on average, it's usually about, if we said maybe four tons per hectare, okay, it's kind of average. So this seems quite low. And why is that? So there are a lot of factors that can t- that can kind of contribute to that so the health of the vines how the vines are managed trellising systems how how the wines are structured or the vines are structured in the vineyard all those things can play into um, that sort of average within there although four may be average you could say that there's quite a common range between one and 12 tons per hectare so why is this quite seems sort of quite low within that um, that range. And one of those things maybe is something that we can relate back to uh, the training system. So when we, so of those 140 million bottles, where are they going? Okay. You can see about 40% staying within Italy and um, of the, the sales in terms of um, value. Okay. About 40% of the, the value is being sold within the Italian market and about 60% in the foreign market. So you can see that the export markets are very important for uh, wine producers in Abruzzo. Within that, where are the biggest markets? Well, we have Germany, the USA, Canada, and the UK. Okay. So, um, Germany, definitely kind of uh, the biggest market there, and then fairly even between the US, Canada, and uh, the UK. People that are joining us from those countries, based on those kind of uh, market shares, I would think that it would be fairly easy to to find some of these wines in uh, in your various markets. Interested if you want to um, include in the chat box any thoughts you have about uh, availability of the wines. And as we kind of work through the various styles of wines, even adding if, uh, you know, you've encountered one style more than the other, or if some styles aren't available in your market, uh, interesting for the consortio to know kind of where people are able to find the wines and maybe where they're still encountering difficulties to find the wines. Production, we're going to look a little bit at um, some of the factors that uh, 
play a part here. So as we mentioned, those production areas concentrated almost entirely in the hills and the province of uh, Kieti has more than 83% of the territory planted with vines. And I will show you on another map uh, in a moment, but Kieti is kind of the um, sort of lower uh, southeast portion of um, Abruzzo. And then we have uh, Pescara and Teramo with about 10% and 6% each. And that's kind of the Pescara is in the sort of center of the uh, the province. So sort of center on the coast. And then Teramo is in the north. And then L'Aquila uh, less than 1%. And you can imagine why, because that is the area that is almost completely mountainous. So there's not going to be a lot of uh, vineyards in there. So we have about 6,000 grape producers, 35 wine cooperatives, and 250 wineries. So you may be asking, okay, how come so many grape producers, but only 250 wineries? So I think that these three figures sort of uh, relate very well to one another. So you have 35 wine cooperatives, which those cooperatives are going to be buying grapes, buying wine from, um, actually, sorry, just in this case, probably buying uh, grapes um, from various producers. So here you have almost, uh, you know, an average of about 6,000 grape producers. So it tells you that there's a lot of people that are farming vineyards and are selling their production onto the cooperatives, but are choosing not to make the wines themselves. And then you have about 250 wineries, okay, that are um, managing production from the vineyard into the winery and out in terms of sales. I think we're going to see that number grow, all right, the number of wineries, because you're seeing uh, a new generation that is kind of coming in and deciding to maybe stop selling the grapes to somebody else and to start focusing on producing the wines themselves and really showcasing their individual terroirs, okay? So we might see that uh, 250 grow a little bit uh, over the next uh, few years, okay? Uh, here, yes, I put this little uh, board from Wikipedia here, this little uh, map with the provinces, so that you can kind of see there was that Chieti area that I mentioned before that has about 83% of, percent of the territory planted to vines. And then the uh, Pescara, about 10% planted to vines, and then 6% in Teramo, and then Barlaquila with 1%, right? Here you can see in this particular slide a little bit of the breakdown of the soils. It's quite complicated here to kind of, uh, you know, there's a lot of soil types there, but you can see, um, let's see here. So this kind of gray area, gravel, sand, and clay, okay? And uh, the yellow being clay and sand, all right? And then, um, three being this arenaceous and pelitic rock. So that sedimentary kind of rock in here. And as we get down more into the Chieti province here, then more that calcareous marly soil. Okay, so those are kind of the, the big ones that um, would focus on. And the black uh, line here <clears throat> is giving you an idea of where the Montepulciano de Bruzzo and Trebbiano de Bruzzo wine areas are. So basically this entire portion that is not too mountainous is devoted uh, to those wines. So when we were looking at those uh, yield numbers, one of the things that I mentioned is perhaps some of the training methods could be impacting um, having those lower yields per hectare. And pergola is definitely one of the uh, factors that comes into play in Abruzzo. Uh, it is still the most widespread cultivation technique, okay? And it's known as the Abruzzo pergola. Um, so you can still see over 80% of the regional vineyards are devoted to the pergola. And so here we're talking about a very high training system. Um, 
that gives you quite uh, big spaces between the vines. Yes, those vines are capable of producing quite large quantities of grape, but there is uh, a significant spacing between the vines. And um, I'm just going to jump ahead to the next slide here because here we have more cordon trained um, vineyards, which um, are used for most of the new plantings that are happening, or if somebody is uh, replanting a vineyard, often it is converted to, or or um, not converted to, it is planted to um, more of a cordon train system, which is probably what most of us are familiar with. However, um, you do see some producers kind of um, embracing the pergola again in some regions within Abruzzo. And again, we can go back to things like climate change to look for why is that happening. Um, with the pergola, you have a lot of natural shading of the grape bunches, right, from the sun. So it can help prevent sunburn and that sort of thing in the in the vine, in the grape bunches. Um, it can also help sort of um, disperse the resources of the vine a little bit more amongst more grape bunches, which then can kind of slow down the ripening. And you sometimes then you can kind of help control. Uh, elevated alcohol levels and final alcohol levels in your wine. And so there are things that are um, positives about the, the pergola. It's not completely an old fashioned system that should be abandoned. And that's why there's still a significant amount of pergola um, being embraced in Abruzzo. So we're going to talk now about uh, a little bit about the appellations within Abruzzo. In the past, there were four DOCs um, and we had eight individual IGTs, okay? So those indica Indicazione Geografica Tipica. So those bigger areas that have fewer rules and regulations, a little more sort of uh, flexibility in what the producers are allowed to do, okay? So now we have one IGT, so this overarching uh, Terre d'Abruzzo IGT, okay, and we have the same for DOCs, but now we have these subzones, and these subzones basically correspond to the the provinces themselves, okay. Of course, if you want to use the name of the subzone on the label, then the grapes have to be grown within that stated subzone. Okay. And um, you can see one important note here at the bottom the mention of superiore and reserve can be used only for the four provincial subzones. Okay. So before it was a little more flexibility about what could be labeled as superiore or reserve. Now, if you are going to produce a superiore or reserve wine, it must be from one of those four provincial subzones. Okay. Here on the left hand side, we have regional DOCs um, with. Um, mention of Superiore or Reserve, so Montepulciano d'Abruzzo, uh, Cerasuolo d'Abruzzo, Trebbiano d'Abruzzo, and Abruzzo, uh, there's like there's an extra O in there, d'Abruzzo. <laughs> and um, then we have these four big provincial subzones, so the Colline uh, uh, Terramane, the Colline Pescaresi, uh, Terre di Chieti, and Terre Aquilane. Okay, so in here, you can see a bit of a breakdown. So you guys have access to this presentation. So you will have uh, this map and I encourage you to take a good look at it because it's a little hard to um, kind of take it all in at once here. But you can see here um, now that we have the two DOCGs, okay? Um, we used to just have the Colini Terramane, uh, Montepulciano de Bruzzo, and that used to be the only uh, DOCG. Recently, not too long ago, they have added the Tulum um, DOCG. Okay, and uh, again, that focuses primarily on Montepulciano, so it'll be labeled as Tulum Rosso. And uh, here you can also actually have uh, varietal wines from Pasarina and Pecorino. 
And then within the DOCs, okay, we have our basic multiple channel Debruzzo. So anything in this green here, okay. And then within there, we have these Sota zone or subzones, okay, as we get into the various um wines that we're going to talk about okay and within this the soto zones or the sub zones you will have varying sort of uh, rules and regulations about um how much uh what is the minimum percentage because they most of them only apply for uh the red wines or the reserva wines and have varying percentages is it have to be 85 percent multiple chiano does it have to be 90 percent or 100 percent so that is one of the things that differs among the different sub zones okay this little alto torino a little tricky to see but right up in here okay yes you can see that there are little pockets of um vineyards that kind of reach in a little inland here maybe some of these um, plateau areas within the mountainous region but most of the production is in this sort of coastal inland hilly band here so what about grape varieties here you can see uh one uh, of the red grapes or black grapes, the multiple Chiano. We're going to talk quite a bit about multiple Chiano in the upcoming slides. Um, but then we also have some very important white grape varieties. So our Trebbiano Abruzzese. Okay, so just take note that the appellation itself is called Trebbiano Abruzzo, um, but the grape variety is Trebbiano Abruzzese. So there is a difference there. And then our Pecorino and Passerina. Passerina may be the one that you're maybe a little less familiar with. Um, it is an ancient grape variety kind of uh, native to the central Adriatic coast. Um, probably Marche boasts the largest area under vine for, for Passerina. Um, the wines themselves can be quite floral, little ripe citrus, some tropical fruit sometimes, um, naturally high levels of acidity. So often you'll see it being used in sparkling wines or sometimes some pasito, some sweet pasito wines. Um, so one of the kind of neat things about Pasolina is maybe its name, which they think maybe is uh, kind of linked to its ability to produce fairly high yield. So uh, one of the synonyms is paga debito, which means like to pay the debts. Um, so uh, the uva de oro, the, the golden grape, not because it turns gold, but because you were able to uh, get some money for it because it produced uh, fairly significant yields. And then we have our uh, Cococciola and Montonico, Maldesia and Moscatello. Okay, so less, um, I don't say less important, but less in terms of quantity that you see of these. Maybe the Cococciola is becoming a little more popular. You're seeing it a little bit more, but uh, the other ones are often used kind of as primarily as sort of blending um, grapes within the, the other wines. Even in the Bible water. Hey everybody, I want to introduce you to the Wine Tasting Club card. This club entitles members to receive half off wine tasting flights at 100 plus partner wineries, vineyards, and tasting rooms for an entire year. Choose from the VIP e-card plastic wallet that is embossed with your or your gift recipient's name, or you can choose to download a VIP e-card mobile app to your phone. This month's special price is only $29 for a one year membership. Take time to order the Wine Tasting Club cards online today and save $5 with promo code WINE5. That's W-I-N-E, the number five. Visit their website, www.winetastingclubcard.com to order your card today. Turn right into wine. This has been another episode of Exploring the Wine Glass. Thanks for listening. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like me to discuss, please reach out on social media. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Exploring the Wine Glass. I am also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Butt. Of course, you can always email me at exploringthewineglass at gmail.com and sign up for my newsletter at exploringthewineglass.com. 
If you enjoyed what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe to help others find me more easily. And most importantly, tell your wine-loving friends, because if you like the podcast, they will too. Podcast music is Wine by Kevins. Until next week, slancha. Right now. Right now.